Okay, so good, uh, good morning or just before lunch. Thank you very much for your attendance at the whole conference. My name is Zdeněk Záhora and uh, I am the chairman of MU Game Studies and also a game developer. And uh, it's a little bit schizophrenic between academia and game industry. Academia is uh, very uh, slowly pushing towards some kind of research and the game industry is really crunchy and uh, sometimes exhausting. But I hope I can uh, uh, introduce you some uh, interesting topics. My presentation uh, doesn't have any pictures, so I hope we can, we can manage with that. Well, at the start of my uh, academic life, I was fascinated, and I am still am, with uh, fandom. Because uh, for me to be a fan, uh, it meant to create a lot of things. And that meant uh, overcoming uh, really hard obstacles about uh, creativity and creation. And at the end, it also meant that people from fandom and uh, people from, from gaming cultures and other cultures, they also were very effective with learning new things. And uh, they did not hesitate to, to fail and to create new stuff because it was just for fun. But sometimes it was more effective than the high education we have, for example, in this country. Well, that's, that's, that's a fact. When, and with the digital culture and the instant feedback system, which is just the internet, uh, it becomes even easier to participate in something that you really like and thus learn something new and maybe make yourself uh, uh, more, more experienced. And uh, in the context of game development and uh, game research, fans and users are therefore a creative power that can be used or integrated uh, into design, marketing, and production. And I don't mean used in a negative connotation. I mean it uh, in a really good way that can uh, support both parts of the negotiation, the game devs and the users itself. But there are different uh, people who are interested in uh, users and fandom and culture of, uh, of gamers. And uh, academics call it usually the participatory culture from the nature of participation about the thing that you like. You are creating something or you are just writing an, uh, an, uh, uh, some, ju just, just a little blog about your uh, favorite game, but you are participating. You are making some new a so-called paratext or metatext to the thing that you like. And uh, therefore, uh, we call it participate culture. Uh, Henry Jenkins is a famous, a famous uh, author who is uh, responsible for a convergence culture book. I really recommend it. And sometimes we call it the labor, combination of play and labor. Because uh, it's true that we are playing, we are creating, but also we are making quite a lot of effort to create something. So therefore, designers call it a user-generated content. I think that's self-explanatory. And businessmen sometimes think about it as a community or as a free, free labor. So it's easy cash. The thing is, all of them are right in their context. And uh, for us, and what I would like to, to uh, introduce is that it can be, uh, we can work with that. And what can we do with it, and who are we? There will be, again, two or three contexts. Well, at the start, to make myself clear, I think it's an important thing to, to discuss is that, that the game can be seen as a discrete object or an artifact, but for our purposes, and for the purposes of this uh, uh, presentation, the games are also a service or a process, and for, for uh, uh, better or worse, it's a communication between different parts. The main thing is that they don't exist in a vacuum, they exist in a certain environment. And with this uh, notion of the game as a, as a service or a communication, we can say that particular game is a particle communication space and a set of processes which aren't uh, universal, they're not general. They can be used in different game genres, in different game contexts. For example, there's a big difference between mobile platforms and PC platforms, uh, and we can make, uh, we can generalize it. But in this process of communication and, uh, uh, and discussion, we can identify uh, different subjects, 
We can ident identify senders, receivers, uh, creators of the content, and such, such and such. And for us, it's important because we can identify the so-called community nodes where the content is created, when it's shared, and when it's used. And just uh, to, to note for us, it's important as for academics to, to uh, discover and examine these kinds of cultures and subcultures and users, but also for, for game developers, because they want to, uh, or we want to, uh, from our game to be played. And we have to uh, identify the places where are our target group or our, our players. And uh, these communication nodes can be, for example, just a YouTube or a Twitch, uh, a streaming platform, uh, something awful, really, fa really famous forum, uh, Reddit, or modding culture websites, and such, such and such. This is just, just an example. Well, if we think for a little bit as a designers, the context, context of so-called participatory culture uh, helps us understand the consequences of our design choices. Uh, if we are making a game and we know how the games could be used, or we have some precedents or the same game genres, we can plan or at least, at least hypothesize, sorry, uh, we can think about the future use of our game. We can get it into the context. For example, if we, uh, from the beginning, will count with the in-game editor, as was the earlier uh, today, there was uh, Easy from uh, uh, Bohemia Interactive, that was the great example of uh, in-game editor, we can think about the results of this tool and this uh, uh, thing. If we are from academia, the context of game mechanics, a little bit of game design, helps us understand the motives and tools for participatory culture. Sometimes it's really hard to uh, uncover these things from the point of academy, academia, which we find really interesting and fascinating, but in the reality, it's just hidden in the game mechanics, and it's logical that users use it uh, like this, what we can see. And uh, if we look at it from the business point of view, the game design principles helps us understand the nature of the game, which for us is important uh, if we want to make a media strategy or marketing strategy, and we uh, try to be not, not to be defenseless uh, against uh, marketing trends. Sometimes we see, oh, gamification, that's good. Oh, emergent gameplay, that's good. We want this, we want this. Or maybe investor says, we want, we want this. But uh, in the core game mechanics of the game, it's not possible, it's not suitable for this kind of marketing. So we should rather use the old method of push marketing or a different kind of communication to our users. So it, sometimes it, it, uh, there are a lot of, uh, how to call it, conflicts between marketing and, and uh, game developers. And the participatory, participatory sorry, culture point of view helps us understand what is marketing even able to stimulate. Sometimes when we, uh, again, try to, try to, I don't know, if there is a mobile game and we want it to be shared, to, to be, uh, we want community, and we doesn't actually understand what does it mean. So these two points of view can help us optimize our plans. And I think I said it already, but just to sum it up, uh, not every game or our target group is suitable for current marketing trends. There are a lot of positions and <coughs> interdisciplinary fields which we can, which we can use. Not everything uh, is suitable for everything. And uh, the time is good? Good. OK. So I wanted just to say a few examples. Uh, if we look at the core nature of the game, we can make uh, three distinctions. I don't know if you guys see, see this, but uh, we can see some. We, we can take a closed linear game, like an adventure, and think in context of game mechanics and participatory culture, these two points of view. And we can say that the game, closed and linear, like adventure and story, is a good 
type of game for personal narrative experience. So we can, we can see uh, at the YouTube a lot of Let's Plays. That's a phenomenon when someone plays the game, comments it, and uh, we can find two, two examples, or many, many examples, uh, from Linux and also from uh, more sandboxy games. But in this example, it's a narrative personal experience. The game is, is, a, is a tool for commentating and for sharing an experience. But uh, the main thing that other users are interested mostly are the, uh, is the person who is talking, who is sharing his experience, not the game exclusively. As a counter example, if we take an emergent gameplay, which is, which is uh, the gameplay which was uh, possible by the programming code, but not implicitly designed by the designer. It was possible, but it wasn't the first goal. So that's, that's so-called uh, sandbox games, where you can do a lot of stuff and create your own game, gameplay experience. So this, this type of example is also, uh, it's a sort of improvisation theater stage for a performer. It's not so linear and personal experience of the game, like the story, but it's a stage where the person can perform with the game or within the boundaries of the game. So it's more like uh, a slam poetry, a little bit. And therefore, it's uh, also very good for Let's Plays because, because that's the new content and the new value of the performer or the uh, gamer. But it also, it's more suitable for Twitch live streams because it's the, it's the beauty of the moment and the uh, unrepeatable uh, parts, even though you can have VODs. And just a three, three, uh, third example, uh, games as a platform for content creation. Uh, if you have an editor or a tool, uh, gamers are creating things, they are participating, they are making the, themselves better, and they also uh, provide another content for also YouTubers, also, also streamers, and all other uh, interested groups. Now, I have two minutes, and I wanted to, to uh, say some uh, examples from Czech games, but I think I will skip it and just come to the conclusion. Uh, but earlier today, there was, there was the great example of, of uh, working with the community, but I will skip it. <laughs> to the conclusion, there are two conclusions, the game dev conclusion and the academic conclusion. And for the game devs here, an indie game, even as an indie game dev, you can optimize your marketing budget, no budget, by understanding all the sides of communication space between game developers, participatory culture, gamers who create, and your game itself, and current changing landscape of consumption. It sounds weird, the last, the last sentence, but it's just the rise of the Twitch, early access, curators on Steam, and this changing landscape. And for the Academia conclusion, it's more vaguely put, uh, the journey from prototype to the release and consumption of digital game is a really fruitful environment, which we can examine to understand the role of new media in topics of creativity, and now I've lost myself. The point of this, uh, this uh, sentence is this, it's an interesting phenomenon, and a lot of things that are precedent for new media consumption uh, happens in digital games culture. And then that's interesting, because from there, it spread out to another media, a Beckley, uh, through reme remediation maybe, to uh, internet at all, uh, to radio, to television. So if you are interested in digital game culture, you sometimes struck gold with something that happens for the first time. And that's a really interesting thing, and uh, I think good academia conclusion. And. Uh, that's all for me. If you'd like to, there are plenty of further readings. There are just a few on the, on the screen. But thank you very much, much for your presentation and for the, for the conference itself. And thank you personally to all the organizers for the, for the conference. Thank you very much.